We're continuing our studies regarding the regulation of mammalian fuel metabolism from Chapter 19, and in this lesson we're concerned with insulin signals. This is our first consideration of hormone signaling with regard to metabolism. Activities of organs that store and release fuel, such as the liver, are highly regulated and coordinated by hormones. Hormone literally means that which sets in motion. They are produced in one tissue, but they influence the functions of multiple other tissues. The most important in fuel metabolism are insulin, which signifies fuel abundance, and glucagon and the catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine, that signify a fuel need. There are many other hormones that are involved in appetite control, fuel allocation, body weight. We'll consider just a few of these a little bit later. Remember from Chapter 10, hormones bind to a receptor and that exerts some cellular response inside the cell. So let's look at those triggers for insulin release. Insulin is released in response to a rise in blood glucose levels. If you look at the lower left here, we have a scale indicating the level of blood glucose in milligrams per 100 milliliters. The normal range in, within those units is 60 to 90. If we drop below that, we start to get subtle neurological signs, hunger, sleepiness. We start to release glucagon and the catecholamines, and that can result in other symbols, other symptoms. If the blood sugar drops much lower, we can actually experience lethargy, convulsions, and coma. Below a minimum level, we begin to experience permanent brain damage or death, and so clearly we need to keep a tight control on our blood sugar. We'll learn a little bit later when we consider diabetes. High blood sugar is also not good, so again, we need to control these levels very closely. Normal blood glucose in terms of millimolar is 3.6 to 5.8, and that elevates to about 8 millimolar in the fed state. Insulin is a hormone that's synthesized in the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas, and the pancreas is illustrated on the lower right here. Here's a zoom in of those islets of Langerhans, and the beta cells are pictured in the rose color here. That's where the insulin is produced. In the center of our slide here, we have a ribbon diagram showing insulin. As you can see, a very small protein. The trigger mechanism for the release of insulin is not well understood. We do know that pancreatic beta cells do not have a glucose receptor, though they do have a glucose transporter, and the trigger for insulin release is driven by glucose metabolism. In other words, the change is not affected by the binding of glucose to a receptor in a signaling cascade. Instead, glucose is transported within the cell and metabolized, and this is what triggers insulin release. One glucose sensor that is known is glucokinase. And it is an enzyme that is present in liver and pancreatic beta cells. It is an isozyme or type of hexokinase called hexokinase 4. As is true for all other hexokinases, and as the name implies, it transfers a phosphoryl group from ATP to six carbon sugars or hexoses, such as glucose, to form the phosphorylated sugar. In this case, glucose is phosphorylated to produce glucose 6 phosphate. Let's compare these two types of hexokinases. In the figure on the upper right, we have substrate saturation curves comparing hexokinases 1 through 3 with that of glucokinase or hexokinase 4. On the x-axis, we have the concentration of glucose as our independent variable and the value of V0 divided by Vmax as a function of glucose concentration on our y-axis. Look first at the activity of hexokinase isoforms 1 through 3 shown by the red curve. Recall that the value of Km is a measure of substrate affinity
and is determined at one-half saturation or 0.5 on our y-axis. Notice that the Km for glucose for hexokinase isoforms 1 through 3 is less than 0.1 millimolar, a very high affinity. Now notice the gray shaded area of the curve that represents the physiological range of glucose concentrations. As we look at the red curve, we notice that most hexokinase isozymes are operating at maximum velocity, that is they are saturated with substrate. Even at very low or very high glucose concentrations, these enzymes do not alter their level of activity. So these enzymes would not be effective glucose sensors for glucose concentration. Now let's look at the blue curve representing the activity of hexokinase 4 or glucokinase. Notice that the Km of this enzyme for glucose is on the order of 5 to 10 millimolar, that is within the physiological range, and that this isozyme has therefore reduced affinity for glucose. Notice also that the enzyme never saturates, it never really reaches Vmax. The activity of this enzyme clearly varies greatly at very low versus very high concentrations of glucose and even within the physiological range. This makes hexokinase 4 an excellent glucose sensor and is why the more common name for this enzyme is glucokinase. It is very sensitive to glucose concentrations. Now notice the shape of the two curves. That of most hexokinases, the red curve, is hyperbolic, whereas that of glucokinase, the blue curve, is sigmoidal. Remember, this tells us that it is an allosteric enzyme and therefore suggests cooperativity of substrate binding. Until now, the only cases in which we've observed allostery are cases of multi-subunit enzymes. However, glucokinase is a single polypeptide. Recall that allosteric enzymes alternate between a low affinity T state and a high affinity R state. At the end of its catalytic cycle, glucokinase is in the R state. If the concentration of glucose is high, it remains in this high affinity state and re reaction velocity remains high. However, if the concentration of glucose is low, the enzyme reverts to its low affinity or T state before binding substrate again and velocity is reduced. Another interesting feature of glucokinase is its subcellular localization in hepatic or liver cells. As the concentration of fructose 6-phosphate increases within the cytosol of the liver cell, glucokinase is sequestered in the nucleus of these cells. Recall that our goal in gluconeogenesis in the liver cell is to convert fructose 6-phosphate to glucose 6-phosphate. This is then dephosphorylated to glucose by a glucose 6-phosphatase so that it can be transported to other cells. As the concentration of glucose increases within the cell, it is readily transported via the glucose transporter and therefore sent to the other cells that are in need of glucose. However, as glucose concentration increases, the enzyme glucokinase would readily rephosphorylate glucose to glucose 6-phosphate and therefore frustrate our process. Therefore, within the liver cell, glucokinase is sequestered within the nucleus so that we can forward this process of glucose production and export to other cells. In our next video lesson, we'll see the effect that insulin has on glucose metabolism, and we'll see it also has an effect on fatty acid metabolism.